Today's reading is from Exposition of the Divine Principle. Every human being is struggling to attain lifelong happiness and overcome misfortune. From the commonplace affairs of individuals to the great events that shape the course of history, each is at root an expression of the human aspiration for ever greater happiness. How then does happiness arise? People feel joy when their desires are fulfilled. The word desire, however, is often not understood in its original sense, because in the present circumstances, our desires tend to pursue evil rather than good. Desires which result in injustice do not emanate from a person's original mind. The original mind is well aware that such desires lead to misfortune. Therefore, it repels evil desires and strives to follow the good. Even at the cost of their lives, people seek for the joy that can enrapture the original mind. This is the human condition. We grope along exhausting paths to cast off the shadow of death and search for the light of life. From as a peace-loving global citizen. It is difficult to find young people today who are passionate about their lives. We find so many young people who, with no goal or purpose for their life, are just wandering around. All great leaders in history had a definite sense of purpose in life from the time they were children. From childhood, they nurtured that purpose held within their hearts and exerted great energy to achieve it. Whether they were sleeping or playing with their friends, these great leaders geared every youthful action toward preparing for the stage that they would stand on in the future. Is that how you are living your life? Aju. All right, now we're gonna have our main speaker for today. He's a wonderful brother of ours, as well as a parent now. So I'm very excited to hear from him as well. So please help me to welcome up a wonderful brother, Sunkuk Burns. Hi everyone, my name is Sunkuk Burns and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about freedom. And not the uh, type of freedom like do whatever you want, whenever you want type of freedom, more of a freedom to deal with integrity and uh, living to your core values and knowing who you are and what you stand for. And uh, yeah, just living in alignment with uh, your, your values. But before I get too far into it, I wanna show a quick video that'll also um, go along with the theme of what I'm gonna be talking about today, which has to do a lot with delayed gratification. So without further ado, ding. Okay, so that's your, all right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Uh, it smells really good. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay.
All right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> so, so cute video, right? What's, what's, what's really interesting about this video, though, is that it's actually a recreation of an experiment they did in the 1970s at Stanford. And uh, but they, they did the same experiment, but they tracked the kids 20 years later. They tracked the kids who had eaten the marshmallow right away, and they tracked those kids who waited, who had practiced delayed gratification, had self-control, and they saw where they were in life, you know, 20 years down the road. And the kids who waited, who practiced delayed gratification, they were miles ahead of their, um, the other people who had just instantly gratified themselves, ate the marshmallow. You know, they had higher SAT scores, they are making greater salaries, they are making a greater impact on the world. So anyway, I just wanted to share that real quick, because that's a little bit about what I'll be talking with. About. But before I go more into it, I want to introduce a little bit more about myself. Uh, my name is Sunkook Burns, like I mentioned earlier. I'm currently 27 years old. I graduated from Stevens, not too far from here, with a bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering. Um, I love playing ultimate frisbee. I was lucky enough to be on a really great team in college. We made it to nationals. So there's a little picture. Um, my wife is here in the, the nursery right now. But uh, we got matched when I was 20 years old, back in 2010. We got blessed in Korea in 2012 when I was 22. Uh, we got legally married and moved in together when I was 23. And uh, we kind of just wanted to invite all our relatives to our wedding and uh, try to bring them kind of closer to our movement and the blessing and everything like that. And then uh, we have two kids now. Um, we have, this is both actually our same kid actually, different stages, but yeah, we have Valen and we have Alvin. And uh, we're, we're kind of growing a very, well, I, I feel, a very beautiful, very fulfilled, loving life. And uh, they're around. Maybe they'll pop in later. Sunmi, you should bring in the kids. I think she can hear us. Maybe not. OK. Um, also, for work, uh, I work as a, like I said, mechanical engineer doing prototype and development, actually, for the US government. Uh, I work for the Department of Defense and do a lot of prototype work there. I feel. Uh, I really love my job. I feel fulfilled doing it. I feel like um, I get to support the U.S. soldier. I really believe in the U.S.'s mission kind of as an elder brother, kind of as a peacekeeper of the world. And I, I love what I do there. Uh, I get to make cool designs and prototypes and practice my creativity there. And uh, I get to do cool things like print 3, 3D print grenade launchers and fire them. And uh, yeah, so I have a good job that I feel very blessed and fortunate uh, to have. Um, I want to discuss a few challenges that uh, growing up as a BC, and I feel like as a common theme that a lot of BCs face. You know, we're born kind of into a culture with opposite outlooks and opposite values than uh, we kind of cherish here in our movement. Um, and sometimes because of that, we a lot, a lot of the times feel like outcasts, like we don't belong, we can't really assimilate so well. And uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, a lot of us grew up with parents who sacrificed, a lot of the first gen, you know, sacrificed so, uh, so much to join the movement and better the mission and support your father right away. And they gave a lot of their material possessions, a lot of their famili familial relationships got broken and uh, also just uh, gave up their higher education. So a lot of us second gen, you know, grew up in more of a, with a lot of um, families with financial difficulties perhaps and uh, po possibly uh, financial sta or influential status difficulties. And uh, also growing up, we're always encouraged to kind of keep this really high standard of like excellence, to always live for the sake of others, to put others first, and you know, to fix the world. You know, we're given this mission, we're blessed, sinless children who need to kind of infiltrate the society and fix it. But uh, you know, as young children, that's very hard, that's a very challenging demand to uh, be expected of, of us to do. So there's a lot of pressure, I feel like. Um, and then. I, know, I experienced quite a, bu a lot of bullying and a lot of, uh, I guess, not, not uh, I was very shy growing up. I wasn't very confident because I couldn't, I didn't feel I had the strength to really display those values that I believed in in a society that I felt like wasn't necessarily looking for them, that I couldn't, I couldn't see right away. 
And then, you know, I was told to practice delayed gratification, to wait for my wife who would be coming, you know, 20 years from now or something like that, and, you know, to, to hold myself pure, to keep my purity. So I feel like we, we, we as second gen are asked to do a lot, a lot of challenges. And, um, and uh, you know, we all have our own individual life course. We all go about, we all have our own, you know, advantages and disadvantages based on how we were raised, our circumstances. Uh, and our unique life experiences. But I really feel like uh, once you take like 100% responsibility for your own life, you know, you, you have full control over your own actions, your own thoughts, uh, and your own how you visualize and perceive the world. That you have 100% control over. So once you, I feel like you take 100% responsibility for those things and kind of dispel those limit, lim limiting beliefs, those limiting ex or, uh, experiences that you think, you know, I'm this way because of this, or, um, you know, I couldn't do this because I was raised this way or that way, and you take 100% responsibility for your life, you can really begin to overcome a lot of challenges, overcome a lot of obstacles in your life, and grow from those challenges that we're all faced with, and really become a better person by it, and uh, yeah, just use those challenges not as an obstacle, as a, as a failure or a roadblock, but once you overcome it, you grow as a person, you become better by it. Uh, so one, one kind of thing that I feel like I was a big advantage in my life, something that I was very blessed with that I feel like a lot of people weren't necessarily was uh, talking, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about my family. I felt like I was um, so blessed to grow up within a good family, you know, my parents, especially with the, uh, the model my parents gave me. My dad and my mom really, truly loved each other. You know, you could tell very, very apparently there was no question growing up. They truly loved each other. And I felt like that was such a great blessing for me because like right now in the world, you know, half marriages end in divorce. But for me, that wasn't like a question for me. Like I didn't doubt that I would have a successful marriage. I saw the model and I felt that was such a great blessing. You know, I, I knew that I was gonna have that with my wife someday, that I was gonna have a great successful marriage. And I think a lot of that, confidence came from watching their model. And I just kind of want to end with this statement. Um, when you're rich, you select your foods wisely, only sating your appetite with the tastiest morsels. When you're poor, you will consume anything to fill your belly. The same is true for love. A child who is starved for love seeks it everywhere and anywhere. So I felt like, you know, even though I was faced with a lot of these challenges, I had such a, for me, the biggest advantage in my life was having that blessed model, feeling that love from my parents, and because I knew that love, I didn't have to seek it, you know, from my peers. I was able to kind of stay strong to my values, and I felt like I could use that advantage to kind of overcome a lot of obstacles, and I knew that's what I wanted. So from that, um, I also wanted to share another quote from uh, True Father. The starting point for bringing about a world of peace is the family. And kind of from those two ideas and just going through my own life experiences and knowing what I wanted, I created this life purpose statement that I want to share with all of you. My life purpose is to be a role model with a sound body, no addictions, financial independence, and a strong, loving family that can inspire and empower others to invest in their families. And I'll kind of go into more about this statement and what we've been doing in our lives to kind of exemplify that. Um, so I want to get a talk about this idea that comfort doesn't equal happiness. You know, everyone kind of wants an easy life. They want, you know, as little roadblocks, as little obstacles as possible and just, you know, uh, just have a comfortable, happy life. But I feel like a lot of times when we challenge ourselves, uh, you know, we, we gain a gr greater clarity, a greater sense of purpose and, uh, and yeah, become happier by fulfilling a lot of our own needs and fulfilling our wants and desires. So I want to give another quote from uh, True Father. and goes, as I was changing my heart to conform to God's love, I also strengthened my body so that I could fulfill my mission. I want to be ready to go anywhere, anytime that God called on me. Then he goes on to say, the body is the container to hold a healthy spirit. It is important for us to be diligent about training our bodies. And uh, so I, I, I really, really like this quote actually, and I feel like I took a lot of these elements to heart. You know, growing up in this church, we have a lot of strong values, a lot of, and especially my dad fostered a lot of these values in me. He never wanted me to drink coffee, so I've never drank, so I kind of want to share some things I've been proud of growing up in this movement and some values and some things I've done in my life that I'm proud of. So I've never drank coffee in my life. I've never drank alcohol. You know, I was uh, part of a big, um, I was into the youth ministry here, and I was always telling the kids, you know, you can't drink alcohol. And uh, so that's one reason I've chosen never to drink alcohol, so I wasn't a hypocrite and I could uh, live, that, live that lifestyle and share that lifestyle with them. 
And there's just been so many, you know, so many horrors that have happened just from drinking alcohol, dry, drunk driving, so many other things that I don't need to go into. So I've never done that. Um, never swore. I've never smoked. I've never done drugs. I've never worn blue jeans. My dad had this funny rule. He didn't want me to be like everyone else. So he's like, everyone wears blue jeans. You're not allowed to wear blue jeans. And I was like, okay, I can respect that. So I've never worn blue jeans in my life. Something I'm super proud of is I've only ever kissed one girl in my entire life. My wife is in that room. It would be cool if she was here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so she, she has been my only love, but she's, she's now my true love. You know, I can get, devote every, all of myself to her. As I was preparing for the matching and preparing for the blessing to invest into her as much as I could, you know, I, uh, when I was like 19 years old, I started doing a lot of things in, order to, in, pre to, in preparation to getting matched. You know, I, started, I wanted to be fit and, uh, uh, you know, look good for her, so I started running at least twice a week. I just wanted to develop my mind more. I started listening to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts, just trying to develop a lot of these life habits that I felt were good. When I was 15 years old, I actually stumbled onto pornography. I was in an uh, advanced placement high school, and they gave us all laptops. And I just stumbled on pornography, which eventually led on to like, masturbation and things like that. And uh, this was probably like the lowest point in my life, stumbling into pornography, stumbling into masturbation, and uh, something that I, I felt so conflicted about. I felt such a disunity you know, between my mind and body. My mind told me, you know, sexual purity was the uh, best thing growing up in this movement with uh, all these values. So this was such a huge challenge in my life. And then um, I, had, I had this issue. Um, eventually, you know, I was able to break free at 19, or it was 18 years of age. I was able to finally break free. And, you know, I'm, I'm eight months, eight, I mean, eight years since I've viewed pornography or masturbation to date, so I'm very happy to share with that. But, you know, having this struggle, I was able, I'm able to now kind of help out. We have a lot of uh, pro, uh, programs to kind of help other young people now, so I can share my own experiences and help with Pure Mind Online. There's my wife and one son. This is Alvin. Anyway, through, through kind of having that struggle, you know, I wish I never had that struggle, but now, having experienced that, I can share with other uh, younger men and even females sometimes um, and uh, kind of share that experience and help them through it. I, I do some uh, online webinars, uh, weekly accountability webinars and things like that. So these challenges that come up, you know, you can, if you can overcome them, you can really use them as a, as a stepping stone to kind of help others and grow yourself as an individual. And, you know, when we got matched, the first night we got matched, you know, I confessed all this to my wife, you know, or the first night we met, actually, I told her, you know, we, we went on like a four-hour walk trying to decide whether we want to get matched or not, uh, betrothed to each other, and I confessed all these things, and I told her, you know, I've been one year clean so far, but I've done this thing, you know, and I really want to change so I can devote my whole heart to my spouse, and uh, can you accept me? And what was so beautiful was then when my wife, you know, turned to me, it's like, yeah, I know you did all these things, but I can see who you are, I can see your character, I can see you put in the effort to change. And she said, I, I can accept you, I want to get matched to you. And that was such a good feeling, you know, to, to have this thing that I hated so much about myself, something that I really, I, ha I really hated it, you know? And I was able to overcome, but then, you know, I still had that stain on me. And then to have my wife accept me wholeheartedly, you know, that was such a powerful, powerful day for me and something I feel so grateful for. And now I'm able to, thank you. And, and now, now, you know, I don't have a conflict in my mind. I'm 100% integrity. You know, I can love my wife wholeheartedly. There's not this side garbage that's affecting my mind. You know, I can, I can focus my love, my desire to her, and I can, you know, in, in turn that helps contribute to my life purpose, which is to create that ideal family without having that trash, that garbage. And now I can help others through that as well. Okay, so that was longer than I wanted. So, and then I was trying to shift my mindset to willingly welcome change. You know, like I hate wearing suits and talking in front of people, but, you know, I try to do as many things to challenge myself to grow as possible. I've accepted, I've, I've accepted a job in the last two months where I have to wear a suit every day. It's only for six months, so that's why I did it. Um, and then just uh, other practices that kind of help. So, oh. So basically, that's kind of that portion. And then um, a part of my life purpose was kind of financial independence. So I want to go into a little bit of that because I feel like to build an ideal family or a strong family, a lot of times, like the number one, one of the top reasons for divorce is actually financial, um, 
financial issues, you know. Just finance is really great on a marriage if you don't have it under control. So we really focused in on that and wanted to work on that. So uh, I want to get into that segment of this talk. And I have a question for all of you. How much is a penny worth after it doubles every day for a month? So like today I give you one penny, tomorrow I give you two cents, the next day I give you four cents, the following day eight cents, and on and on for the next 30 days. Any guesses? One million. No. What is it then? <laughs> Come on, I need five guesses. Pastor Minoj. <laughs> You're cheating. Okay, anyone else? Yes, William. $15? Okay, maybe. Anyone else? Give me at least one more. $30,000. So the answer is $5 million. And if it was 31 days in the month, it would be 10 million. You see how it, it, it doubles so, so quickly, you know? And this is kind of the power of, you'll see later, actually, yeah, of like compound interest and really investing early. Anyway, I thought that was a cool example. Um, so, so like I was kind of mentioning, why financial freedom? Why is this important? I want to share another quote from True Father. Money is a means to do something, not the goal. Before you make money, have a plan for spending it. Money gained without a prior objective will soon be wasted. So for us, our objective, you know, build that strong family, and we want to get rid of as many barriers as possible. And we really, you know, saw that we really wanted time. Sunmi was working as a teacher, and uh, she was, you know, working full time, making good money. I was working as an engineer, and we were really trying to focus, you know, how do we get more freedom? We want to escape the paycheck to paycheck lifestyle. We want the freedom to raise our future family at that point how we wanted to maybe uh, some goals to retire early and things like that. So we really, we started um, this real estate company called Metal Horse Properties. I was born in the year of the Metal Horse. Had a BC designed the logo. And uh, what we did was we bought a four family house, a four family property when our eldest son was six months old. Sunmi was still on maternity leave. And uh, you know, we bought it kind of grungy. We fixed it up um, frugally, because we were raised very frugally. So we used that to our advantage. We bought you know, cabinets on Craigslist. We had BCs who helped us. There's Carlson, my brother-in-law, throwing cabinets out the window. Um, Sun Marie, you know, six months after giving birth, doing a lot of work here too. And, uh, you know, we, we fixed up the property a, a lot. Uh, before I get too much further into it, I want to describe a few definitions here. So uh, for finances, you know, your income is money you bring in. For most, the majority of people, it's just a paycheck. Some other people have side income, side businesses, uh, side projects, other ways to make money, and maybe they go fundraising. Uh, and then your, your defensive um, for finances is e expenses, so and how you limit expenses. So money you spend you know, on gas, on rent, on things like that. And then uh, your cash flow is your income minus expenses. And then I want to talk about kind of assets and liabilities. So assets are something that pay you, and liabilities are something that cost you. A lot of people think like a car is an asset, but a car, is, car you know, you buy it for 30000 off the dealer, and then two years later, it's worth half what it was worth. So it's not really an asset. It's something, it's a liability that keeps costing you. So I have two houses pictured here. We bought one of these houses, uh, and this one was in Saddlebrook. It's for $440,000, like and this one is in Garfield for like $430,000. This is kind of like a dream house. You know, you have a nice front lawn, a nice brick house, nice garage, four bedrooms, very nice. And then this is like a four-family property, a little grungy looking, not that, not that appealing. I mean, what, what do you guys kind of want? Which house? You want the four family, <laughs> because you're smart. Okay, so, so we went with the four family, you know. We, I mean, we want to raise our family, I guess, in a nice place, you know, but we don't care as much about the nice place, the nice car, the fancy clothes, the fancy whatever. We care more about the time freedom to, to raise our family the way we want to. So we, we bought that four family. We bought it for $430,000, and the reason why that's important, you know, we have, so this, this four family, these are actual numbers, these are, like we pay eighteen forty-five for the mortgage, ten thousand for the taxes, insurance, utilities, water, sewer. Totals to three thousand dollars a month. You know, three thousand dollars a month is a lot of money. You know, half my paycheck would have gone into if this house was just a regular house, and I, we bought this dream house. Half my paycheck or more would have went straight into that house. But we bought that four family, and because we bought a four family, even though it has a three thousand dollar expense, it also has other renters that kind of contribute to it. 
And all that, the rent, you know, we live in unit one for free, and then we rent out the other units, and that comes in at 4,000, around 4,500 a month. So we're actually positive. We get to live for free and then get some side income coming in. And that allows us, allowed, you know, Sunri was six months, or she was in maternity leave when we came in at that point. And uh, she was able to quit her job very comfortably. You know, we're living for free. We have the side income coming in, surplus. And she, we were able to make that decision very easily so she, we can invest in our family. And then um, now she's full time at home with the kids the way we, we kind of planned and hoped for. Um, and then we also gain equity, you know, after 30 years, the renters are paying our, paying our mortgage, and 30 years, we'll own a $430,000 property free and clear. And all we had to do was put the down payment. We put 10% down, $43,000, which is a lot of money, but, you know, we were making, you know, 50K there, 50K here, over $100,000 a year. And we, you know, packed our own lunches. We bought cheap, used, reliable cars. We, uh... We, uh, you know, we, we, never, we hardly ever went out to eat. We lived at, we lived at my parents' house in a small room. And we made those sacrifices because we had this plan, you know, we want to invest in our families, we want that time freedom. So we delayed our gratification to, to do that. Um, so here's some more before and after pictures. We're very proud of what we did. We put in a coin-operated laundromat for all four units to use. We bought used cabinets on Craigslist, used kitchen countertops and everything, used appliances. Um, we refinished the wood floors. You know, this is Sunri, just six months after, you know, she's still nursing and she's doing a lot of these, these works, you know, which a lot of people don't want to do, but again, our goal was to commit to raising our ideal family. Uh, some more pictures. Okay, so, so we made that initial purchase of that four-family house, and we bought that in 2015, so that's two years ago now. And uh, after all the work we put in, it probably, we probably put in also around 50K of expenses, materials, and stuff. But it actually appraised for 200,000 over what we bought it for, for 630,000. So we used that equity, you know, $200,000 in growth, and we bought another property just last August, actually. So we have a four family property and a three family property now. So we have seven units all bringing in, um, well, there's still a lot of work we're doing in this triplex right now. Actually, we have a contractor there working on it right now. And, uh, but together, so we bought this, this one's worth 630, this one's worth 370. Together, they're worth $1 million, you know, and we did that very quickly through the early sacrifices we made. And uh, together, the uh, rent, once this is fully rented out, will bring in around 8,500 a month in gross rent. There's always maintenance and vacancy and other considerations that are going to take away from that as well. But 8,600 8, a month, that's over 100,000 a year that the gross rent will be coming in. Of that, of course, we're probably only going to see maybe like 15 to 20K just because of all the expenses. But it's, uh, it's, it's definitely given us a lot of financial freedom and financial independence. So that's one way that we were kind of able to achieve that, that goal. And along the process, we, uh, a lot of cool things happened. You know, this is one of our tenants. It's just a couple, Una and Dan. They're a married couple. Uh, with, they have a dog and a cat. They're very nice, though. Uh, we didn't initially want dogs, but they were so nice that we decided to take them. Um, and one really cool thing is like a year into our, um, they, they rented from us and we were, it was time to renew, they actually gave us notice that they wouldn't be renewing because their marriage was kind of on the rocks and they were thinking of split when the lease ended in August. And uh, we were very sad to hear that, you know, the wife came to us telling us this and we actually sent her the uh, five love languages, an audio book. And uh, she told us the next time we saw her, you know, they had, they had listened to it together. They had stayed up all night talking about it. And the husband was actually crying, you know. He was crying because uh, it had impacted him so much. And they were really talking about how they can work through this. And then the next time we met them, they came back with a one-year year lease renewal. And we were so happy, you know, that they were going to renew their lease and that they were going to stay together. And even to the... <laughs> even... Even, even today, they just came back from a nice vacation together, you know, and I feel like they're a lot happier. I mean, just seeing them, they, they're a lot happier. And also, when, when they first moved in, they're like, oh, we're never going to have to ki have kids, so don't worry about it. She was, like, I guess, opposed to having kids and things like that. But seeing Valen, you know, she made a comment one time. She's like, if I knew I was going to have a son like Valen, then I would definitely have a kid. And then uh, now she's, uh, she's always asking, like, hey, can I babysit your kids? And uh, I love your kids. And she, we're always, like, bringing her, our kids over for her to, like, watch now and things like that. So, and, she's, and I feel like now they're starting to think about maybe having kids. So that's a cool thing that happened there. Um, won't go into that. 
Uh, we developed another passive income stream through Amazon FBA, fulfilled by Amazon. Uh, I used to sell a lot of things on eBay, but then you'd have to piecemeal go to the mail, deliver things. This is kind of more of a passive way of um, selling, selling things on, on, uh, online. So basically you bulk ship product to Amazon and then they fulfill your orders through their warehouses. And the, the way we figured this out actually is when Valen was born, our eldest son in 2015, they, the hospitals, they always give you a pacifier. It's this one unique pacifier. They don't sell in stores. We brought our son home. We lost the pacifier. He's screaming his head off. We can't find this pacifier anywhere. We go to all the stores and uh, yeah, we can't find it. So then I look on forums online. Everyone's having this issue. I eventually source this pacifier, find where it's sold, and I'm like, okay, let me fulfill a need. Let me buy a whole bunch of these, post it on Amazon, and we've been selling them ever since. Um, we, we, and uh, now we're developing new products where we can sell other things as well. And uh, yeah, we got great feedback. So uh, I want to talk about that. Okay, I want to talk about this because I feel like it's a very powerful lesson that I think people can immediately think about and immediately take action from. So um, let's say that you make $50,000 a year. You know, this is your base salary, $50,000 a year. Maybe you make more, maybe you make less. And let's say after taxes, Social Security, Medicare, um, state taxes, really, in reality, you bring home $36,500 a year. You know, so, you know, like, if you make $10 an hour, you don't actually see $10 an hour on your paycheck. You maybe get eight, seven, something like that. And that's because of taxes and things like that. There's 365 days in a year. So take that $36,500 number, divide it by 365 days, and you're actually bringing home $100 a day. That's your spending power, $100 a day, right? So we're taking that $100 a day. Let's say, you know, you have expenses now. So let's say you, you rent an apartment for $1,500 a month. You know, $1,500 a month, divide that by 30 days in a month, and that's $50 a day that apartment's costing you. So that's half your paycheck. Half your $50,000 paycheck is going straight to, into your housing, your rent. So that's a huge cost that we're saving on as being financially independent. House hacking, they call it, by living in that for, for family. So after that, that $50 is spent on rent, you're left with $50 every single day, you know? And then you have other expenses, things like, you know, maybe you went out for breakfast, like today, let's just say, take today, you went out for breakfast for $5, you, after church you go out for lunch and for another $5, and then you have a $10 dinner, you know? And it's kind of hard to spend $5 for lunch these days, but add it up, that's $20, so you spend $20, so you're left with $30. And then maybe today you have to fill up your tank, so you spend on gas, or maybe you have to get Christmas gifts that cost $20. So then you're left with $10 that day. And like I said before, savings is your income, your salary, minus your expenses. So today you would have saved $10, but you also have to factor in things like recurring expenses that are every single month. Things like home insurance, health insurance, car insurance, utilities, phone bill. So you have to factor that, factor that all in. So I think a lot of, so this is kind of just to address, you know, how quickly $50,000, which seems like a whole ton of money. Like I thought if I ever made $50,000, I'd be, you know, I would never have to worry about money again. But you have to, you always have to measure, you always have to put intention, I feel like, into all areas of your life. And I feel like finance is a big one because it causes so much strife in so much areas. A lot of people want, you know, success, but you really gotta, you gotta think about it. So I hope, I hope you guys can take this example and really think about it. And, you know, I have, I have like spreadsheets. I, I, I run a blog and I have spreadsheets to help people. So if you're interested, um, you can go on there. Uh, I have everything tracked. We tr Sun Marie and I track all our expenses down to, you know, every, everything. Everything's on this expense sheet. We have all our income tracked. We have all our savings tracked, all our investments. And uh, I have a template of that on my website you can work on. Um, so this is a chart kind of working. So I said like defenses. There's like defenses and offenses. So defenses is savings for uh, finance. So like I said, track your expenses, create a budget, you know, uh, you can create a budget from that expense sheet and see how much you're left over and then, you know, make it smaller so you actually have a savings at the end of, of the thing. Don't buy liabilities, buy, uh, buy investments, you know, and buy big bargains, uh, shop used, you don't always need the newest thing. I love, I love quality, but I buy used quality typically. Um, spend cash, you know, pack your own lunch, limit your eating out, uh, live at home, cut down on recurring costs as much as possible. Um, and then working on your offense, kind of build all, all other income streams to come in. Uh, when I first started, when I was eight years old, actually I would ride my bicycle to CVS and I would buy those bulk packages of candy from CVS and then I'd come home, set up a little table in my living room and then piecemeal sell it to my siblings and I'd, you know, double, double the cost and make money that way. 
And uh, yeah, so I've always had like an entrepreneurial mind. But I, I since advanced from that, and I went to eBay, and I started selling things uh, on eBay. And then actually in college, I started flipping cars to pay my tuition to go to Stevens. And I sold 19 cars in my lifetime, uh, just buying from Craigslist and selling after like cleaning them up and making them better and advertising them better, finding good deals. I got a good scholarship um, that actually, Actually, I got a scholarship from the Department of Defense. They paid my full tuition on top of giving me $25,000 a year as a cash check just to do with whatever I wanted. I kept that to save and invest into that uh, four-family house later on and other things and stock investments. And then I, later I got a career which brought in a lot of money and then I got into real estate investing and then now I'm trying to develop other passive streams of income. So basically the idea, get your dollars working for you and not the 0.0035% interest you get in a savings account, but other methods. You know, start investing in assets, like your education can be an asset, stocks, IRAs are an asset, real estate, any, any passive income business like that. And again, like I was saying, I'm kind of going through a lot of this very quickly. I talk about everything, including pornography and masturbation on my website, where I'm trying to just, so the, the point of this website is to learn about creating passive income streams, being frugal, living optimistically, and designing a wholesome lifestyle all for the purpose of investing in your family. Like I said before, that's my life purpose statement and I feel like that's a way I wanna kinda give back to the world and contribute and uh, I'm trying to do that through this blog. I have a lot of articles, you know, I talk about how I sold those cars. I talk about other things like backpacking through Europe with a baby, um, travel hacking, we talk about how to start your IRA step by step the scholarship I was talking about, and some other money-related things. I don't know, I'm just really into money right now for some reason. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff there. The link there is faminvestor.com if anyone's interested in diving deep in any of these topics. I go into the real estate thing too. Um, and that's kind of it. So I feel like I, I've practiced a lot. Well, let me, let me read this first and then I'll close. So this is the last slide. And, I, and this, this quote I've read many times, but until recently it hasn't really impacted me. But I think it's, it's a really great quote. So let me just share it with you. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in every one. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. You know, freedom. And uh, yeah, so I just wanna, I kinda wanna tie in everything. You know, this is my own journey, my own uh, purpose, and you know, these are my own challenges that I've faced, and there's many, many more that I could go into, and many other mistakes that I could go into, personal mistakes I've made, but kind of like, to grow, grow from those, and to kind of really, kind of look to the future, look to what your life purpose wants to be, to delay that gratification, to delay those immediate needs, you know, maybe you don't need to go home tonight and watch six hours of Netflix, maybe you can research, become better, and uh, I don't know, I just kind of want to give that message of, you know, just improving and delaying gratification and how I found value in being a part of this movement. So uh, thank you.